My uh, childhood, as I'm sure was the case for many of you, was uh, certainly infused with, with stories. And while words were read out loud to me, it was up to me to come up with the images of the, of the story in mind. And although Winnie the Pooh stories were my absolute favorite, there were others I, I grew to really like. Here are just a few. You may remember the fable of the tortoise and the hare. The, the hare gives the turtle a hard time for being such a slow poke, and after the turtle could take it no longer, and could take the teasing and the taunting no longer, the turtle challenged the hare to a race. We all know how the story goes. The hare, halfway through the race, decides to take a nap. After all, he's so much better than the tortoise. And in doing so, when he awakes, he discovers the turtle beat him to the finish line. Then there's the story of the two roosters. They fought day after day, trying to demonstrate to the other that he was the boss of the farm. And during one fight, one rooster decides, I've had enough. And so he retreats to the hen house to lick his wounds. The other rooster, however, He's feeling very good about himself. He flies up to the roof of the barn and yells out, I've won, I've won, I've won. Well, an eagle hears the racket and swoops down and carries the rooster off the roof to her nest as her young eaglets are hungry. And lastly, I love the old Dr. Seuss story of Yertle the turtle. You may remember Yertle was the king of a small pond filled with turtles. The turtles had everything they needed, and life was wonderful, all except for perhaps King Yertle. One day, Yertle said, I'm the ruler of all that I see, but I don't see enough. I need more. So Yertle commanded that a few turtles form a new throne by climbing on top of one another. And when in place, Yertle climbed up the backs of the gathered turtles. Yertle proclaimed, there's nothing higher than me now. He enjoyed his elevated view. The story continues, however, with turtles complaining about the weight they are carrying, and Yertle in response demanding that more and more turtles climb on each other and to create a higher and higher and higher throne. And eventually the stack of turtles gets so high, because Yertle continues to want a more impressive throne, that the whole thing collapses and Yertle comes tumbling down with the rest of them into the mud. While these three stories vary, they actually speak quite well to our gospel reading today, and they speak to something very specifically, and they speak to the dangers of pride. Pride is a tricky thing, as it easily can lead to bad places. A brief caveat before I continue. One writer says, there is, of course, a good type of pride. Paul, for example, was proud of the churches he established, but his pride was not arrogant or self-exalting, Instead, he made it clear that his accomplishments were the fruit of God's grace to and through him. The writer continues, These days, most of us will say that we're proud of our children or our favorite sports teams or perhaps something we've accomplished. And in cases like these, we are, one hopes, saying that we are really pleased about something good and are not engaging in the sinful type of pride and arrogance we hear about in Scripture. Well, anyway, certainly there are many stories in Scripture about the tough outcomes that stem from the wrong kind of pride, self-serving pride. C.S. Lewis writes about pride, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. That's a pretty striking comment, isn't it? The utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. C.S. Lewis writes, pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. C.S. Lewis writes, well, issues of pride and the resultant mess are reflected in story after story in Scripture. In the Old Testament, pride was the root cause of the demise of many leaders. King after king after king after king. Read the Old Testament. It's just crazy. These guys just don't get it. They put themselves and their egos ahead of everything else. And what happens? Time and time and time and time again. There's this pattern of the leader's ego leading to the destruction of the country over and over and over again. Pride has caused so much suffering in so many nations around the world. 
In Scripture, too, remember that Cain killed Abel because his pride and ego were wounded. Joseph ticked off his brothers and was sold into slavery. Why? Because of his pride. There was Jezebel, who was not only prideful, but full of herself and led her husband, King Ahab, down a very wrong path. And then in the New Testament, the people who challenged Jesus the most refused to follow Jesus, were at odds with Jesus, eventually demanded that Jesus be crucified, were the religious leaders who had the biggest egos. Then there's a story in our reading today from Luke's Gospel. Jesus is teaching about prayer. Charlotte spoke about some of it last week. Today's reading is a bit different. Jesus is teaching about prayer, and he tells his story in the middle of his teaching about prayer. He says, listen up. Two people go to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a religious leader, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by and said the following, thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. I'm not a cheater, sinner, adulterer. I'm not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a lot of money away. I'm so faithful. I'm so good. I'm so great. I've got it down. Then, Standing at a distance, the tax collector, afraid to even look up, says, oh, God, be merciful to me. And he crouches down and pounds his chest. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, will return home justified before God. And then Jesus turns the heat up on the Pharisee. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And Jesus touches on that point all over the place. Remember in his teaching where he says, if you go to a great party, don't sit up at the front, sit at the back, sit at the least place. He talks about humility all the time. Well, anyway, as I, as I thought about our reading today, and as I thought about it, I, I thought to myself, wow, I'm Robert, and I am so glad I'm not like that Pharisee. Man, I am really glad. He would... He, Man, he, 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 he was such a fool. He was such a fool. I, I'm glad I've got this religion thing down right. <laughs> I've got, I'm, I'm humble. I'm humble. I'm not like that guy at all. Aren't you so glad you're not like that Pharisee at all? Pride is ego, isn't it? Pride and ego are tricky. They can lead to some pretty bad things. History shows that. Now, one thing we talk more about than anything in the chapel is love. And Jesus said, everything is about love. Love is what matters. It's all that matters. And I believe that there's one thing that we need to think about, among many other things, when we think about love. And that is that one path toward love, one path toward creating the world that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, one path toward the kingdom of God, one path toward making love possible toward God, others, and ourselves is to work toward humility. And it requires vigilance and di diligence. Our current presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's selfishness. And humility is quite contrary to selfishness, isn't it? And so humility actually is one path to lead us to love. We think about how do I love more? Well, maybe we need to think about how do we become more humble? Because it's the place that creates space for other people. So today I want to look at humility from a number of different angles. We've looked a little bit at scripture. I want to look a bit at, at, at um, some research that's really interesting. Uh, but let's, let's look at some things. One person who researches humility states that humility is understanding our own strengths and our weaknesses appropriately, not under or overestimating either one. I think that's really a great definition. It's understanding our strengths and weaknesses appropriately, not under or overestimating either one. Another person writes, humility reflects the extent to which someone is willing at least to entertain the possibility that he or she might be wrong about something. Humble people 
research shows, are also more tolerant of ambiguity, and they realize that not every problem has a single definitive answer. They tend to seek out two-sided arguments. Another person writes, humble people are those with a habit of being so unconcerned about themselves altogether that they focus squarely on the other person. Humble people are not so much marked by an absence of ambition and marvelous things, but by an unwavering commitment to the other. And as I think about humility, I think it's ultimately a matter of the heart. Humility, I believe, comes from the realization that not one of us has it all down. No one has the answers. What we know is pretty limited, and everyone, all of us, have brokenness within us. Everyone sins. All of us have faults and weaknesses. Nobody is a perfect parent or boss or spouse or leader. Every human being has his or her stuff to deal with. I certainly do. There is no perfect team, coach, CEO, neighbor, Christian, or minister, thanks be to God. And I find this idea of humility and seeking humility to be a relief. When I think about humility, I, I, I feel this wave of relaxation coming over me because I feel like it's not me anymore, it's us. It feels like there's room for relationships. There's room for imperfection. There's room for healing. There's room for connectedness. There's room, most importantly, for love. I love what another person writes about humility. Humility means understanding who God is and who we are in light of God. Humility means some obvious things, like the ability to say, I am sorry, I made a mistake. It involves vulnerability and transparency. It means we can say, I don't know. The great Archbishop Desmond Tutu once said, humility is the recognition that your gifts are from God, and this lets you sit relatively loosely with those gifts. What he means is we can sit loosely with our gifts and what we do well because we know where they come from. He goes on, humility allows us to celebrate the gifts of others, but it doesn't mean we deny our own. Briefly, to help us know what humility is, we also need to know what it's not. Another researcher on humility states, humility is not a, a down, I'm no good, low self-esteem feeling. That's not what it's about. It's not about self-deprecation or self-flagellation or self castication or putting oneself down. It's not about groveling. It's not about being passive or not willing to speak up. And it doesn't mean we're not bold. And while we think about humility and what it is and isn't, it's important to keep in mind what Paul thought about the topic in his letter to the people in a place called Philippi. Paul wrote, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. That's a powerful statement. Think of ourselves the way that Jesus thought about himself. He had equal status with God. But he didn't so much think of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the, the status of a, of a slave and became human and became human and he stayed human. It was a humbling process. Paul writes, think of yourselves the way that Jesus thinks of himself. In other words, as followers of Jesus, if we want to take our walk with Jesus seriously, if we want to help leverage more love in our lives, we need to work on humility in every setting of our lives, including our work settings. Here's some more research on humility that I, f I find to be really interesting. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, there's just an explosion of research on humility. There's a ton of research on leadership. And from most of the research that I see, it's clear that the best leaders are those that are humble. There's been a ton of research on the relationship be between humility and the effectiveness of leadership. A lot of studies show that leaders are more effective in inspiring teamwork because they listen more to people around them. Hence, they make better decisions. Jim Collins, the management expert, notes that two traits 
describe the most impactful leaders. One, the one that is very passionate about the organization's mission or purpose. Guess what the other is? Humility. Other researchers note that the most effective leaders across settings are those that understand they're not the smartest people in the room. They encourage other people to speak up. They respect differences of opinion. They champion the best ideas of whoever it is in the room that comes up with the idea. They admit mistakes. They shine light on other people. They ask for honest feedback. Wow, that's just a ton of research about humility and leaders. And for those of us that are leaders in any situation, it's important to remember humility is key. Psychologically, humility leads to resilience which is the ability to bounce back from tough stuff. It's about knowing when we need help and asking for help, and that takes humility. Humility also enhances our emotional well-being. That's a lot of stuff to think about. So with all this said, what are some things to consider as we work toward becoming more like Jesus? What are some things to think about in terms of becoming more humble in our daily lives. Now, I'm going to go through a, a, a litany, it's not going to take long, but through a litany of questions. You can't possibly remember them, but as you, as you hear the question, if there's one that kind of rubs you or causes you to pause a little bit, that's the question that you want to think about just for today, just that one question to think about for today. To spend time with it prayerfully, because it may be where you and I, whatever that question is that rubs us, it may be that area in which we need to do a little work on with God and with others. So here's some questions to help us think about our own humility. Do we accept that we are gifted people, yet at the same time do we acknowledge where those gifts come from? Do we embrace the reality that no one person has it down, that everybody gets it wrong, including me, sometimes very wrong, that we all blow it? There are no exceptions to this. Do I really admit that I blow it sometimes? Do I admit that I get it wrong? Do we listen more than talk? Or do we talk so much that we never give ourselves the chance to really listen to people around us? Where are we in that talking, listening balance? Do we have the courage to ask people for feedback from other people? What do you think about this and me and how I've done? Do we seek feedback from those we trust? Do we seek feedback from those we trust who have a completely different opinion on something? How defensive are we day in and day out? Are we willing to seek information, but specifically from sources with, that represent perspectives that we don't agree with? Can we listen, not speak, to alternative sources and viewpoints? Are we humble enough to realize that sometimes we're on the opposite side of what's true? Can we release being judgmental? Can we acknowledge that we all have prejudices and biases? What are mine? Are we willing to say we got it wrong? Do we say we're sorry? Do we spend time with God repenting, turning back to God? Do we spend time working at experiencing joy and pleasure in response to another person being in a good place that it's experiencing joy and pleasure. Do other people's joys bring us joy? Where are we? Where am I with anger and hostility knowing that if I'm in a place that's hostile, it's a sure sign of a lack of humility. Being ticked off is a sign of not willing to see something from another person's perspective. Can we let go of worrying so much about what people think of us, releasing our vanity? Can we laugh at ourselves? Can we not take ourselves so darn seriously? 
do we thank God for our blessings? And where are we with gratitude to God day in and day out for all that's good and right and wonderful? Tough questions to think about, and hopefully there's one that grabbed you a little bit. And it's wherever that place of rub is that God's inviting you and me to think about our humility. And finally, as one person writes about all this, to put on the mind of Christ, to be like Christ, to humble ourselves. To do so, we need to make a firm decision to ponder and understand and adopt Jesus' way of thinking. His values, his attitudes need to become ours We must allow his humility to take hold of our thinking, his humility to take hold of our desires, his humility to take hold of our conduct. And we must want humility for ourselves. And then pray, pray, pray that the Holy Spirit will change us. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that the tortoise and the hare And the two roosters and Ural the turtle have some things to teach us that are perfectly in alignment with Scripture. So this is tough stuff. It is for me at least. And so I invite us now to a few moments of prayer, thinking about our journey of humility with Jesus, our journey of becoming more and more like Jesus. And to spend some time, some silent moment in prayer, asking God to help help open us up so that we will see humility as God does. And let us pray.